Yeah, I mean, I, I kind of kicked us off, but um, you know, really just, we wanted to focus on some of the market updates, what we're seeing in the news. Um, and th this question stems from, you know, current clients wanting to know what else can we do at the end of the, the second part of the year to minimize our tax bills or to affect our, our cash strategy. Um, so really we're gonna analyze what's going on in the market, see if there's any new news that's come out and uh, we'll go over some things that can affect business taxes, business cash, as well as uh, personal taxes. Um, so with that, I'll toss it over to you, Miguel. Yeah, for sure. So just quick agenda. Uh, I'll just keep it really simple. Um, you know, what's trending, what's what's new, uh, just market perspectives, things we're thinking about noodling on with clients. Um, and then, you know, what what do you do in Q3? And, you know, my thesis, if you will, is Q3 is is, is really a time to to get creative. I mean, th this is not the, this is the year end checklist of what you need to do from a compliance perspective. It really is, hey, these are kind of strategic points that we see clients working through. Uh, you know, we're seeing some issue processing on kind of where we are in the year, given the context, um, and then some of the conversations that we're having. So, um, you know, this is, this is really, I think, high level because the world is changing so fast. Uh, Quick disclaimer, more for the recording online, that basically everything we say is um, general uh, guidance and information. Uh, certainly uh, do not point to this webinar and say it is the reason that you made a very big decision, unless that ends up being a very successful uh, decision, then definitely let us know about that. But otherwise, uh, our lawyers insist that we uh, exclaim that this is uh, generalized and there are exceptions to everything we share. Um, so trending, so interesting in the news, uh, and, and I think you've seen this, PPP is still in the news. Um, and just when you think we're over it, uh, I find a cute cartoon to bring it back into the fray here. Um, of course, uh, PPP is something that small businesses uh, as well as big businesses got. And I thought this cartoon was, was really cute, uh, especially with the Olympics and basketball going on. Um, the, you know, a lot of the big businesses got in first. Of course, PPP2 tried to correct for that. Um, but where we are now is that you know, PPP forgiveness applications uh, as well as audits um, are very relevant. Um, virtual currency becomes white hat. Uh, I'll, I'll caveat that in a bit. There's some interesting news going on there. Um, and I think it also plays into capital allocation, which we'll talk about uh, in the context of inflation. So in, in the context of inflation, you should do things differently. Uh, and virtual currency is an interesting uh, potential hedge, I guess, and I'll get into that. Um, and then just two, int two things that we see in the marketplace that we're not really gonna talk about, but it is interesting that what we saw with COVID uh, and a lot of our businesses who happen to be uh, e-commerce, digital marketing, and uh, software, whether it's software as a service or otherwise, um, what you're starting to see is that those that were completely virtual uh, did just fine, meaning they had remote staff, there were ways to get things done outside the office, but there's also ways to sell and interact with customers uh, without physically having to be there. So e-commerce as an example um, is very clear. So we have a whole host of uh, clients that during the pandemic um, were maybe, uh, you know, one example is that a client in Oklahoma who had a side hustle selling uh, arts and crafts kits on Amazon uh, FBA. So really just sourcing uh, and making margin through good advertising. Um, and it became their full-time gig because of course, as shutdown approached the they couldn't have enough inventory to meet demand uh, and they actually sold. So um, leads right into this M and a on the rise. I mean, there's a lot of PE firms out there aggregating uh, a lot of these businesses that have done well during, you know, almost accidentally uh, during this period. But what's more interesting, I think is that we're starting to see companies um, create a virtual and in, you know, in-person physical uh, experience combining them. Uh, some of the ways that we're seeing that is what has changed in consumer behavior is QR codes. I, I remember years ago, you know, handing out flyers with a QR code for some fundraiser we were doing and, and we had zero hits online to this website because nobody was doing it. But now um, as we go to restaurants that sometimes just have a QR code on the table, uh, we're 
have as consumers, we're very likely to be in the real world and jump into the uh, digital world, online world, uh, which of course, you know, as, as, as Dan on this call knows, um, is, is really where you get that meaningful data and continue that consumer relationship. So we're seeing that across the board. And funny enough, uh, one company that we met with on, on Tuesday uh, had dinner with, they have kind of a quasi um, virtual and in-person experience, right? So the punchline is in person's not going away, uh, but we are now as consumers more adaptable to uh, engaging online, um, you know, in, in the, in, sorry, I got someone joining here. We, we are more adaptable to creating a digital relationship that we can continue elsewhere. So the company that, that talking about, I won't disclose who they are, but what they do is they have uh, these, um, you know, rooms that you might be a dressing room at say a retailer um, and you go in and you can interact with the product in a uh, virtual way. You get up on a screen, you get to see what the product is. If you hang up the, whatever it is you're not buying, there's an RFID code comes up on the screen and you can interact with it online. So as a trend, again, digital transformation, that's all old, uh, but there is a new version of it now that we have changed as consumer uh, as consumers. Um, and then what we're also seeing is, is M&A by way of uh, PE aggregators, but also I'll talk about a little bit with respect to capital gains rates. Um, first thing on PPP, just wanna highlight this because right now it is July, 2021. Um, the new PPP application uh, is now, that's the 350, uh, 358S. Um, that one is the one that came out just this year. It's the most simple one. Essentially, if you have under 150, um, you more or less have a blanket forgiveness. Caveats to that, of course. Um, but after a year, the loan becomes payable. So most of us are in the, the stage of um, you know, PVP being over a year. So if you haven't, make sure that that application is in the works. Um, PPP2, uh, we've met with a lot of our clients that got PPP2 and for that reason uh, are not able to do something like the ERTC or other things that rely on knowing all your PPP forgiveness. Um, we were waiting on applications coming out. Uh, Chase just announced yesterday, in fact, that in the next few weeks, and that's a quote, I wish I had something more specific, uh, they're gonna be sending out those applications. So, um, you know, if you got PPP2, uh, the second round of PPP, uh, which is now closed, you can no longer apply for it, ran out very fast. Um, applications are coming due very soon. The forgiveness will be different. It will not be the same, uh, you know, 358S form. It is going to be a different form because the rules for qualifying were different. Um, so it's gonna look at things like revenue. Um, you're gonna have to make a disclaimer about, you know, the government shutting you down, things like that. So um, just a quick public service announcement, take a look at that. Uh, Interesting, uh, we're starting to see PPP fraud uh, in the news. Um, and I've linked to my, my favorite story here. Uh, yeah, it's from TMZ, uh, reputable news source, of course, um, that uh, Bachelor stars, these are, these are individuals who, um, I don't know if you wanna call them performers. I mean, I guess you can't because it's reality TV, uh, but their personalities with a brand, um, they created LLCs or had LLCs that they were sole proprietors through, uh, and they got PPP loans. And uh, you know, if you look it up on Twitter. It's like on TMZ. It's it's a big thing that fans are reacting to. Uh, and I have a quote here about what's specifically going on. Won't get into that, but I think the punchline is uh, number one that this is public information. So uh, just be aware of that. That your PPP loan with your business entity name uh, and personal name, especially if you got it as a sole proprietor. Uh, it is available online. Um, and then two, that, you know, this wasn't, this felt like it was a kind of free money craze, but, um, and I, you know, the, the truth is, is that treasury will not be, and SBA will not be able to check all of them, but, you know, it, it is something to just be aware of that audits are, are on the rise. Um, the trend I did want to spend some time talking about, because again, it's relevant in an inflationary world, uh, is that virtual currencies are, I said earlier, they're becoming a little more white hat. And that might seem silly because, you know, I'll talk to people that 
think that, you know, finally we understand where, where Bitcoin is or um, we understand the legitimacy of it. And you have major institutional um, investors, you know, stockpiling cash in there. So part of the world says, hey, uh, we get it right. Like we're on board. Uh, I think a lot of people agree that cryptocurrencies are here to stay. Uh, and we did another webinar. We said, hey, does it make sense to include some kind of deployment of your own capital into virtual currencies? I won't get into that. I think what we're starting to see, though, with key news pieces is that um, governments are starting to find ways to incorporate uh, some element of cryptocurrencies into um you know, what, what their official fiat is. So the big news coming out of Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, MIT, uh, is that they're working on a two to three year uh, project in creating a Federal Reserve cryptocurrency coin. Um, I have no opinion on it, nor, nor can I tell you to uh, look out and buy that. Uh, but it is interesting in that, uh, you know, in, 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 in a, area that has decentralization as it's one of its main features and tenants, we're going to see something that government creates, right? So can government create something that's purely decentralized? It's a question not to debate here, but it is an interesting point that government is starting to say, um, well, you know, we're, we're going to join the party, if you will. Uh, I mentioned this point here that treasurers, uh, recent article, um, came out saying that treasurers are actually putting some of their cash into a uh, cryptocurrency as a hedge. Um, but there's a lot of hesitance uh, and a lot of those surveyed said uh, they are not willing to create uh, material exposures, meaning, you know, they'll dabble, but not going to go in there. The vast majority, 76% of treasurers said they are not willing to create a material position in a virtual currency. Um, because of the regulations, compliance, uh, and taxes. Um, and a key point to crypto is that from an IRS perspective, they treat it as capital gain. Uh, essentially, whenever you sell, uh, well, the IRS calls it selling, but you know, if you use Bitcoin to buy a pizza, um, from the IRS perspective, I mean, that's, that's a sale. So as much as you know, enthusiasts are saying that it's a lot easier to exchange crypto. Like there's this thing called lightning where like literally if you have a wallet, I could send you uh, what's called a Satoshi uh, within, you know, five seconds. Uh, so it's become easier. However, you know, I'm kind of with the treasurers on this and as well as other investors is, well, unless you're going to buy and hold, can you really ever use it for its intended purposes with the compliance framework that remains in place today. Um, and again, I mean, I, I can be bullish on this, but the point is, is that tax is kind of holding them back uh, because the difference is if you go to, you know, a different country, exchange the foreign currency, that's not a taxable transaction. Okay, yeah, you've got to disclaim if you're taking, if you're leaving or coming back with the you know, cash over $10,000 from a US perspective. But essentially there's no capital gains transaction, right? You're getting, uh, you know, if you go to Japan where the Olympics are right now, right? I'm going to Japan, I'm getting yen and giving up dollars. Uh, it is not considered a taxable transaction. It is considered an exchange of a currency medium. Um, and the big question that I'm getting, uh, I got is, well, wait a minute, there are countries who are adopting cryptocurrencies as their legal tender. Uh, does that maybe suggest that the world is on its way to recognizing crypto, uh, cryptocurrencies as uh, a currency? Um, and it's kind of hard to look that forward. But what we do know is that Treasury uh, which interprets the laws uh, and the Internal Revenue Service, which creates um, its own regulations that state how they are going to treat things. Uh, right now, they, they, they're continuing to keep it as capital gains. Uh, so essentially, you're concerned that if you do hedge into crypto and it does take off. So if you do this as a corporate strategy um, and you want to put some money, cash that you're sitting on into crypto, well, if it appreciates and you use it, you essentially have created a 
capital gain transaction that now is reportable. Uh, and you're going to have to pay a capital gains rate on whatever that, that, that gain was. Um, similarly, you know, there's obviously you wouldn't hedge to anticipate that the value of the currency would fall. Um, but, you know, essentially it's, it's something to, to consider and think about uh, as we move into the future. Uh, and uh, I think the, the, the conclusion here is that the corporate world is not quite ready uh, to adopt that as a strategy, but as uh, forward looking people, I think uh, we're starting to. So just market perspectives, uh, and this is kind of what the backdrop is for any kind of strategy. I know that, um, you know, there, there are probably pretty specific things that as clients, when you get to looking at your books and your tax, you, you're going to want to know, um, well, how much tax am I going to pay? But hold on, let me just kind of give the backdrop that I think should influence the types of decisions that we're going to start making here uh, as we start to think about the end of the year. Um, the first is a move to assets uh, and safety in anticipation of inflation. So uh, I did talk about treasury, uh, you know, the treasury function of companies. That's a strategy that um, is a fringe capability right now that we are starting to look at clients who have a significant balance sheet of cash and starting to ask the question of, you know, why not put it into a category where that cash is safe and it's going to grow. So I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. Now, the, the issue is that in a world where inflation becomes rampant, holding on to cash is actually a, a, an inferior strategy. Um, capital gains rates and M&A. Uh, this is something that's becoming a trend. One is that the demand uh, by aggregators, private equity to, to, to consolidate and then on sell uh, is great. You know, th that means that they are looking for these opportunities, but from the sell side perspective, uh, there seems to be on the margin individual business owners who are maybe towards the, you know, I'm going to call it the, the last 75% of their career um, who, you know, are saying, hey, I'm planning on selling anyway in five years. Maybe I have grandkids. Maybe I've got enough in the bank to feel secure. Um, I think I'm going to sell this year. Why? Because I think that long-term capital gain rates uh, are going to go up over the next few years. So that being the backdrop, it is almost an incentive uh, to get out uh, in a world where right now there's a lot of demand uh, looking for those. I mean, I can tell you, I get emails uh, and LinkedIn messages every day uh, for accounting and tax firm aggregators. Uh, not going to sell. No, I just claim that. Um, but I, I think it's a very important point because it does influence the kind of decisions that you make on the margin. Um, typically, you know, somebody looking to hold onto a business for another five, 10 years, um, you're not really thinking about anything that's not right in front of you. Well, with the, uh, you know, anticipation of capital gains rates, that's coming closer. I'm not even going to risk it. I'm going to get out in 2021 while the market's hot. Um, again, I think I mentioned that EY study, but, you know, right now rates are all times low. Cash is cheap. But what do you do with that cash? We'll talk, we'll talk about that. And that's a core part of the Q3 Blue Ocean strategy. Uh, just some quick notes on inflation. I mean, I think it's definitely at some level here. Um, the challenge is that there are still a broad basket of goods and services, as is the language in the CPI, uh, that aren't increasing as fast. And a lot of the commodities um, in areas that are increasing are actually increasing for, uh, is, it, is it exogenous or endogenous? Exogenous reasons. So basically forces outside will take lumber, for example, right? Ashen's doing construction himself at his house. Uh, and for some reason, wood is really expensive, uh, has to do with supply chain, um, things going on. And, and that's happening across the supply chain. Uh, I went to buy a car the other day and I've never had this experience before, um, but I was told there was, there was literally one car left uh, and I was like, well, you know, I can come back in July. And they're like, no, no, you don't understand. Uh, this is the last 2021 manufactured uh, of that type. And like, we can't even find it at other dealerships. Like dealerships are not, you know, sharing. We have one allocated vehicle over the Pacific Ocean uh, that you can buy. And 
you're probably going to put a deposit down today uh, because if not, someone else will. So never had I thought, you know, never had I thought we'd be in a market where we would do sight unseen house buying. Um, we're now in a market where we're seeing sight unseen car buying. Uh, again, because of a supply chip, supply shortage with, with uh, com, you know, semiconductor chips. So again, there's a lot of things going on right now. Is it inflation? Is it not? Uh, well, the one thing that a lot of uh, smart investors, uh, you know, of which I would say I'm not one, uh, look at is they look at what the rates are going to be, uh, you know, per the Federal Reserve. And right now it's looking like the policy is um, we are looking at it, right? <laughs> Like it will be sooner than we thought previously. We don't know when it's going to be. So as much you know, clear as mud as the as the saying goes. But the point is, is that you know we are in a cheap market environment, and it's not going to last forever. So it comes back to that question I ask. That I think if I can give you one question to ask, it, it's going to be capital allocation. But in, and embedded in that question is what you do with cheap cash when it's available. I wanted to show a quote by um, one of my heroes, Ray Dalio, who talks about economic cycles. And I'm just going to leave it up here um, to stimulate some thought because I'm not going to read through it. Um, I'll leave it up here for just a quick second here. So essentially, I mean, you can you can read through this and we'll send this around. But I, I think um, the point highlighted is that there is a there is a natural cycle um, that comes on with inflation and the cost of debt. Uh, and then as a result of increasing rates, once inflation is rampant, the Federal Reserve will raise rates uh, and that will increase the cost of debt. Now, for many of us who are thinking about you know, our debt, it's like, well, hey, wait a minute, I've got my debt locked in. But the the point that the debt cycle um, highlights is that the co that it's a trickle down effect, that there's a lot of debt out there that is marked to the FOMC rate, that as that increases, the cost of debt goes up. And as you have inflation and less money in the system, you enter a contractionary period. So we don't know how long it would be. Like, I, I think also, you know, Ray Dalio in 2017, 2018 was saying, hey, the, there's a correction coming. And we've had the longest sustained, you know, if you, if, you, if you ignore COVID, but we've had the longest sustained period of growth um, in US history. Uh, so, you know, does the cycle exist? Yes, it does happen. But the big question is when. Uh, but I think this is a wonderful quote. And uh, Ray Dalio actually has a whole book on um, the business cycle, if you will. Uh, and essentially, it all points to, hey, at some point, the cost of debt is going to rise, contraction is going to happen. Uh, but, you know, is that in the next 18 months? Uh, we don't know. But apparently, you know, what the market price is in is the next year or so. And there's no anticipation that this will happen in the next year. Uh, but I think it's a wonderful quote that I think a lot of us are thinking about, hey, if I've got a run rate of 18 months of cheap debt, cheap debt, uh, it, should in, it should incentivize uh, some kind of decision making in the near term. Um, so blue ocean strategy. So what do I mean by this? Uh, well, one, it's, it's summer. And uh, it just sounds nice, you know, let's go to the beach and let's take a uh, very broad um, perspective to problem solving, um, to maybe thinking not necessarily about the things that are right in front of our face right now, uh, but looking out to what might happen over the next uh, 18 months, really, or, or two or three years. And these are the kinds of conversations where, um, you know, it's not necessarily driven in tax and accounting, although... What I love uh, about what we do is that sometimes we can ask the thought provoking question that creates some kind of a strategy or vision uh, that our business owners and clients have that translates into a very tangible and direct uh, tax or finance strategy. So um, one example I will tell you is this M&A question, which is essentially getting at how big do you want to get? 
uh, what we find oftentimes uh, when we onboard a client is that the problems that you have from zero to somewhere in the middle between three and, and, and 600,000 in sales, again, I'm gonna use one metric that's pretty general, are very different from the company trying to ramp up to 1 million to the company at 1 million trying to ramp up to anywhere at five. And then you have this category of five to, um, I'm just gonna say 25 million that have a very different approach, very different resources and very different incentives. Again, also how you're capitalized is um, going to affect that. Um, but I, I think the point is, and, and a lot of our clients have told us is that companies that wanna grow fast need to capitalize differently, whether that's giving incentives to different shareholders. Um, and there are very, mu very much, uh, there are implications to looking at things like a um, retirement plan. One of the most common ways that we see larger companies in that five to 25 million uh, create a way for a company to grow is they'll create an ESOP plan. So that essentially gets to a company ownership of, and there's all these tax benefits to it, uh, but it really doesn't make sense until you hit 40 employees. So what are smaller businesses doing as they're thinking about going big uh, and aren't looking to sell? Well, it depends because if you're structured as an S corp, you're going to want to start thinking about, it, you know, what the implications are of giving out shares. Because in an S corporation, if you give out a percentage of the company, uh, they now become a K1 recipient, meaning it's essentially becomes a form of a partnership. Now I'm generalizing here, but what we found is that oftentimes a company that has a favorable tax strategy to reduce income tax isn't always the best poised for high growth. So one of the questions that I think is a good Q3 blue ocean strategy, right? Kind of big, big, big picture thinking out the next 18 months uh, and then, you know, narrowing in from there, narrowing into, you know, the remaining six months is how big do you want to get? Essentially, yes, it, it arrives at some kind of a projection, but I think there's a big difference in a company that is trying to really uh, 10x, in which case I will tell you that there's a lot of literature that says that you've got to give some kind of equity uh, and the company that's set up as an S corp and says, hey, I just want to pay as little taxes as I can. I want healthy five to 25% growth. Uh, and I want to keep taking these big distributions, in which case you wouldn't necessarily do that. Uh, the beauty is, and I'm not going to get into too many details here, is that there is an in-between strategy that you can implement. And that has to do with phantom equity. Uh, phantom equity is a growth strategy for companies that want a combination of tax benefits uh, from a structuring perspective, but also having a long-term plan for each employee uh, or contractor that says in the event of a sale or um, you know, these phantom units translate into a percentage of profit that's measured at the end of every year without having to go into a restructuring uh, from a tax perspective. So um, that's just an example of something that you know, is driven into uh, a specific strategy from the question of how big do you want to grow? So something that I think every business owner should really have clarity around is, you know, what does growth look like over the next uh, three to five years? Oftentimes I find that uh, a lot of businesses that we work with, right, we, we specialize in the one to $5 million space. Uh, they're going to say, look, we, 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 we just want to, you know, we, we just want to keep everything going and keep adding customers and grow revenue by, you know, 20 to 50% this year. And, and that's all great. Uh, but it's not going to unveil some of the strategies that you should really start implementing uh, now that are really more focused on, you know, year three uh, and year five. Um, the more immediate ones that we're looking at is projecting cash needs. So uh, cash flow is vital. And I can tell you that we talk to clients who say I'm sitting on a lot of cash to clients that are saying, hey, um, I need to restructure debt, um, you know, sub debt and prime debt uh, in order to keep my business growing 
and paying down that debt, right? It goes back to this point on inflation of the cost of debt. So the cost of debt is so, so low right now that what you're able to do essentially is grow the company much faster than the cost of debt. So that spread, again, comes back to growth strategy, uh, is going to be a central part of a business that maybe needs to look at uh, how they're going to service that over the next three to five years. Um, the big Q3 strategy that I think uh, is very relevant for our S Corps, uh, so if you're an S Corp, listen up, is accountable plans. And in fact, next week we are doing an internal meeting uh, with Mike Tripp on our team, who's going to go over specifically how to roll this out to our clients and what an accountable plan essentially is. Uh, I'll get to it because I think we're coming to uh, time is it's based on a tax projection. And I've got generally just a list of items, depreciable assets, you know, office expense, meals. The point is, is that based on a projection like this, there's usually an amount of tax due, right? So on 216, uh, let's say that tax due is, uh, you know, I'm just going to throw out a number net of, you know, W2 salary, call it 40,000. What a reimbursement plan or an accountable plan allows you to do is it allows you to transfer cash from the profit. So from this 216 to transfer something up to, I'm going to call it 20,000 to you as a business owner, as a reimbursement for um, certain expenses without it being taxable to you. Um, so it's a very exciting strategy that um, we're going to start rolling out. But the, the point of this is you need to project out, number one, what profitability is going to be, followed by understanding the cash needs in the business. Uh, and those two things will drive, I was talking to a client who wants to break even, knowing where you are, how close you are to breaking even, right? Making sure you pay in as much as you owe. Uh, is going to take number one, clarity, but number two, an understanding of what available tax strategies you have. Because in this case, even though there's a profit of 216, well, depending on how much tax credits are available, uh, depending on what estimated taxes were, uh, and depending on the accountable plan, if that's something you can execute, might actually already have you in a position where you're getting a refund. So oftentimes what we see when we don't do projections is you've got a client, they just look at their QuickBooks. They say, oh, operating income on my uh, business is, we'll use this number, 216,000 without necessarily looking at the amount that has come in from estimated taxes. Um, and they're saying, oh my gosh, I gotta, I gotta start writing stuff off. I've gotta start spending money. Uh, and you're doing so oftentimes without really looking at ROI it ends up resulting in um, basically a loss that didn't need to be a loss. And I think what we want to stress, uh, if anything, is that the use of cash is going to be the most impactful, uh, I think, blue ocean strategy you can do um, over this next 18 month period, given the context uh, that we're in. So let's talk quickly about some of the ways that we think about uh, where to deploy cash. Um, one of them is we talk about the growth share metric, uh, matrix, sorry. Um, and essentially this involves looking at your business within the various channels um, of uh, essentially revenue or products. So uh, I always use the example of uh, P and G. Uh, now I get it. Most of our clients are gonna be in e-commerce or service or advertising. So often tangible goods aren't the best example, but it's easy to think about something conceptually like this, which is to say that you sell a series of different products. Um, and if you're PNG, you've got, let's say you've got Tide, uh, you've got, um, uh, you know, at home cleaning products, and you've got, you know, new versions of old products uh, like Tide Pods. Um, essentially the challenge that every business needs to do is understand where they are in the growth share matrix. And as you can see here, it's pretty intuitive that um, this here is how fast something is growing. Uh, and this is how much market share you can get. Now, obviously this goes back to kind of corporate business 101 where you really want the most market share. 
but think of market share as something in a differentiated space. So if you have a niche, for example, uh, we would consider that in to be this high category, right? So to have something differentiated, uh, that's also high growth, right? Anything in the, again, this is where trends come in, right? If you, if you are doing something like in our business, if you are doing paper filing returns in person, that is going to have a low, that has low growth potential. It's just over time, it's not gonna scale. People aren't gonna wanna have to come in and sit there the whole time. Um, what you want is you want to be on a trend in a differentiated space. So part of what the growth share matrix encourages businesses to do, and I have more reading and, and documentation on this, is to ask what spaces you need to double down and invest in. Um, and you can see that there is actually some value to having something in a low growth space where it's very differentiated. This is you call the cash cow. So essentially, you know that even though it's not the future, you know that you have a differentiated position and therefore you essentially have some kind of a moat. Uh, this is not a bad place to live, but you should not reinvest in it. This is where you're going to take your cash out to reinvest in the other favorable businesses. Now, where don't you want to be? You can probably think bottom right, low, low, right? Undifferentiated, you're a very small player in a big market and it's a low growth. They, they used to call this, uh, you know, I think it was, uh, it was Bain. Uh, no, sorry, it was Boston Consulting Group. They used to call this square um, the dogs. Uh, the reason they, they changed it, I think they changed it to pet now, uh, 20 years later, but they called it dogs because it, it's a loser essentially. But the reason they changed it is because they used to go into these meetings and they would talk to these managers, you know, and let's say they were talking about, um, you know, a product that's, that's undifferentiated, you know, it's expiring um, USB drives. I'm going to pick on that, right? They would go in there and they would tell the manager, hey, you know, your whole division is not worth investing in. And call him a dog ended up got it, getting a little uh, controversial. But the point is, is that these are the spaces that need to be sold off or killed. Um, what's interesting in today's market is that you're seeing a lot of small operators go into something that is considered to be a dog by most companies that are large, again, USB drives. So I say this and I say USB drives, uh, you know, it's not the future, everything's going cloud and it's completely indifferentiated, but someone will come in and create a very specific type of, you know, thumb drive that will have temporarily high growth and temporarily high differentiation. So what's interesting is actually, if you look at the market uh, where you're seeing success on a micro scale, is you're seeing companies move from, um, you know, slow growth, slow potential, uh, high competitive environments into a differentiated space, which temporarily uh, will have a um, high growth market. So even you might argue that um, it might actually be low growth, but it starts becoming differentiated. So it becomes a cash cow. Those are the types of businesses that we're seeing private equity buy up. Um, so the point here is that there, Every business has the ability to think through what components of their business fall into either square. Um, and it's something that we think even before you do something like a discounted cash flow statement um, or an IRR analysis on the cash flow of a new product, uh, which you might want to innovate, you might want to think about where on this matrix, again, this is by Boston Consulting Group, uh, this lands. And where we'll end things is, um, we do have a way that we particularly look at uh, capital strategy. Uh, we typically think of three buckets when it comes to cash. Uh, you've got your earnings and profits. That's essentially um, money that you can take off the table. Uh, you've got your operating budget. This, you know, we'll also call a war chest. So um, this is kind of the safety and run rate that you need in your business to feel comfortable over the next, again, 18 months, whatever it is. Um, the statistic we last saw during the pandemic was that the average small business has enough cash to run for uh, 27 days. That number, at least in, the, in, in, in larger companies, once everything started shutting down, you saw companies saying, hey, I, we need a year of cash to keep a lean version of our business model running because we have no idea what's going to freaking happen. The safe spot is usually somewhere in between. So we'll do this evaluation with clients uh, to assess their risk uh, and essentially 
the sweet spot seems to be uh, anywhere two to three months. Um, but the idea again is that if you're looking at cash in the bank, projected cash in the bank, how much can you take right off the table? Uh, what is going to be your operating uh, budget, your war chest? Uh, and then we have this third column, which is my favorite, uh, which is reinvestment. So reinvestment, um, and I, I think I'd find these all on this on this last term, but reinvestment essentially getting at something that over time will increase cash flow, but right now uh, is a significant cost. So if you don't have a general percentage at which you place profit, business funding, or operating budget, uh, and then your earnings and profit, dividend, you know, what's basically adding to your wealth, uh, you don't have a capital allocation strategy. So we're not here to tell you what it is. There is a way for us to look at what uh, a benchmarkable about is. Um, and it's our final recommendation here that everything that is important to you from a growth perspective, from a product matrix perspective, from a capital allocation perspective, can and should be benchmarked. So our biggest initiative this year, I think I was telling uh, Dan about it, was that we are uh, taking aggregated you know, SMB data and we're essentially looking at these KPIs to see if there's anything predictive about you know, what the fastest growing company's salary to uh, sales ratio is, um, how much cash, and there's some internal data that we just can't get, you know, like how much cash on hand uh, as a percentage of annual revenues uh, is on a balance sheet at year end on average, right? There's a percentage there. Um, the point is, is that you can only start adding meaning to numbers uh, once they're tracked and once they're relative. So, you know, knowing your numbers through and through, admire that, but really that's step one. Uh, you have to contextualize it within the space of uh, benchmarking, um, uh, not just against, you know, other competitors, but also uh, about your own numbers. So um, I think just to summarize, you know, when, again, Q3 is really about us saying, yeah, you know, there, there are some, there is less than six months left. And, you know, if you do want to do any kind of these strategies, um, whether it's uh, allocation of capital or uh, a reimbursement plan or looking at what your taxable income is now and increasing deductions to get that down, um, or maybe just putting away for that tax bill. Uh, yeah, Q3 is the time to do it. However, I will also just say that Q3 is kind of a good time to make significant changes uh, based on what a three to five year growth plan might be. So maybe you don't think so short term and just say, hey, I just want to lower my tax bill this year. Maybe you do think about, actually, I want to recapitalize the company so that my employees or partners have phantom shares that they can take out, in which case, like, why would I draw down the profit? Um, so again, you know, yes, this is a webinar. And as much as I'd like to say, here are the three things you need to do, because uh, those videos get a lot of clicks. The truth is, is that there are a series of questions that we want to pose to you uh, in the context of this market environment, in the context of what's in the news, uh, and in the context of how we think the, the framework we use to think about strategy that we want to push onto you to get you to start thinking about it. So uh, if I can get you to start thinking about these things and you know you noodle on this uh, later at any point, I think I've done my job. Uh, thank you to everyone on this call. Um, I am going to put myself on mute here, let Ashton wrap us up, take a drink of water. And uh, if anyone wants to ask a question or, or just say, uh, you know, have a nice day, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and, and, and chime in. Yeah, well, definitely. Uh, thank you, Miguel. So um, a good session. Um, seems to be a lot that, that we'll want to further dive into with our clients. So if any of this is something that you want to dive into a bit further, um, just let me know. I'll, I'll get you the appropriate calendar link or we'll set up the appropriate meeting to dive into this. Um, but while we still have uh, you know, there, another six minutes here, uh, we'll open it up to see if there's any questions, um, anything that you want further clarity on that we went over. So Miguel, looks like you covered it pretty well. I mean, a lot of the content that you went over really is um, specific to individual situations. So um, we can always chat about that offline. Um, if anything that you guys want to discuss, um, just let me know. Uh, reach out to me and we'll go. For